After nearly two months of a stunningly successful counteroffensive, it's almost unthinkable that Ukraine could lose the war. Not only are Ukrainian troops increasingly better equipped than their Russian counterparts, but Russia has been forced to send poorly or even untrained conscripts straight to the front lines. And we already have confirmation of fresh conscripts from Putin's mobilization being killed in Ukraine. But the war in Ukraine is proving to be a long one, with many experts warning that even with increasing Western support, Ukraine could be in this for the long haul, a multi-year affair that will expend titanic amounts of blood and equipment on both sides. Victory is far from certain. So what would happen if Ukraine loses the war? To answer this, we need to look at how Russia could actually win at this point. Things are looking grim for Russia. Putin's refusal to treat his special military operation like the war it really was led him to putting off mobilization until his forces were facing dire manpower issues. Now he's rushing to put out 300,000 conscripts to the front line. Though some reports state that the real figure is a million. A million is definitely a more realistic figure if Putin still wants to conquer all of Ukraine. But 300,000 is a solid start to replenishing the staggering casualties Russian forces have suffered. The problem is that mobilization is coming a day late and a dollar short. Immediately after the invasion by Russia, Ukraine kicked off its national mobilization effort, leading to tens of thousands of recruits and volunteers being recruited into the armed forces in the first week alone. The surge of manpower was so huge that the military was forced to turn people away, encouraging them to instead form territorial defense units until it could handle the influx of volunteers and conscripts. NATO soon stepped up to the plate and started shipping Ukrainian troops to its European bases for training by its own military professionals. This relieved the incredible burden on Ukraine and allowed it to expand its mobilization effort. Now Ukrainian conscripts are finally hitting the front lines after six months of NATO standard training. By comparison, Russian troops aren't just less well trained, but its own conscripts are facing rapidly accelerated training or none at all. Some units report as little as two weeks of training, with the government promising a few weeks of refresher training for conscripts who were all supposed to be military veterans already. Other units, however, have been sent to the front with only a day or two at the most of training as Russia struggles to play catch up with a surge in Ukrainian manpower that threatens to leave Russia outgunned and outmanned in hostile territory. To no one's surprise, many of these conscripts have zero previous military experience, only adding to their ineffectiveness as a fighting asset. Equipment is another serious problem for Russia as its stockpiles of modern equipment are rapidly either being destroyed, used up, or graciously donated to the Ukrainians by retreating Russians. It's estimated that Russia might have lost as many as 50% of its active tank forces. And there's serious weight to that suspicion, as increasingly older and older tanks are being brought out of deep storage for frontline duty. The arrival of T-62s in Ukraine was followed by the promise from Russia that they'd be used as stationary fortifications. Like most things from the Russian government, this proved to be a lie and soon confirmed T-62 kills were being reported from the front. Its modern tanks haven't been faring much better though, and in one of the most stunning developments in the entire war, it was discovered that Russia's vaunted First Guards tank army suffered an overwhelming defeat in Lyman during the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Dozens of tanks were destroyed or simply abandoned by Russian troops in retreating panic. This is significant because the First Guards was Russia's premier fighting force, specifically equipped and designed to go up against the very best that NATO has. Outmaneuvered by Ukrainian forces suffering from low morale and under threat of being encircled, Russia's elite tank force was forced to abandon its vehicles and run for its life. Now Russia's second best tank forces are having to take on Russia's best tanks being driven by Ukrainians. If Russia were to pull out of the war today, it would take at least a decade for it to rebuild its armed forces, and that was before calculating the cost of sanctions against the nation that it bears today and is likely to for a very long time to come. Russia is experiencing a microchip and semiconductor crisis, forced to recycle those components from consumer goods to alleviate the shortage. Banned from buying these and other critical components of modern military tech, Russia will at best produce a handful of tanks each year, or be forced to field a mid-20th century fighting force. Either way, this spells disaster for the nation and strongly hints at defeat in Ukraine. So how could Russia miraculously turn things around in Ukraine and what happens if Ukraine loses? For weeks now, Russia has been saber-rattling by threatening the use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Many rightfully feared that the annexation of four eastern Ukrainian provinces would lead to the use of tactical nuclear weapons, as Russia doctrine states that nuclear weapons will be used to defend Russian territory. To be more specific though, Russian nuclear doctrine states that nuclear weapons are to be used when a conflict threatens the integrity of the Russian nation, something that Ukraine's refusal to cede these annexed territories does not accomplish. Putin, however, cares little for Russian law and doctrine, and the threat of nuclear weapons remains. These could be used to secure victory, but only if Russia is willing to use a lot of them and only if the rest of the world does nothing. 
tactical nuclear weapons are typically under 100 kiloton range, although there is no set limit on their yield. These weapons are meant to defeat formations of enemy troops, not level cities and military bases. This makes them inherently limited in their use during the present conflict, because Ukraine has learned to widely disperse their forces only to bring them together rapidly for a sudden counterattack or offensive. This means that targets where a tactical nuclear weapon would be effective only exist for short periods of time. The rest of the time, enemy troops are simply too dispersed to be worth using them. So Russia could opt instead to simply use many of them. Even a dozen tactical nuclear weapons wouldn't do much damage to change the course of the war. Russia would need to commit to using several dozen or even as many as a hundred just to hit enough targets of high enough military value to impact Ukraine's ability to fight. But doing so comes with the immediate consequence of crossing a red line that NATO has repeatedly warned Russia against. And while NATO has not made it clear what the consequences would be, it's believed that the US and certain NATO allies are ready to retaliate with conventional power against Russian forces in the Black Sea and Ukraine. If, however, NATO does nothing, Russia could potentially use nuclear weapons to bring Ukraine to heel. However, it threatens irradiating much of the territory and even itself due to the fallout carried on easterly winds. Another way Russia could win this war would be through a decapitation strike against Ukraine's government. President Zelensky has cemented his place in Ukrainian and European history for his wartime leadership of the nation. However, eliminating him could cause support for continued resistance to rapidly collapse, not for a lack of fighting spirit amongst Ukrainian troops and the people, but because the Ukrainian government is still full of Russian sympathizers. The nation has struggled for years against corruption fueled by Russian intelligence operatives and money. Famously, the approaches to Kherson had been mined and the bridges prepared for demolition as Russian troops advanced. However, someone ordered the mines cleared and explosive charges removed, clearing the way for Russian troops to take the city. Russia could use its large army of special forces to undertake the assassination of President Zelensky and hope to manipulate the surviving government into putting a pro-Kremlin figure in place. All that figure would have to do is call for a ceasefire and the momentum of the war would shift away from Ukraine, perhaps permanently. This is exactly what Russia had in mind at the start of the war, and even after its attempt to take Kyiv failed, it made several attempts on President Zelensky's life using intelligence operatives and special forces, all of which were foiled by Ukrainian special forces and his entourage of guards. All it would take, however, is one sniper's bullet to potentially change the course of the war. The only other realistic way Russia could win this war is by exhausting the West's support for Ukraine. Already there's fear of Ukraine fatigue amongst Westerners. After seven months of military and financial aid, some Westerners might see there's no clear end to the war and pull their support. But Ukraine is winning the war, and cutting off support now would be a disaster not just for Ukraine but for Europe itself, because Putin's ambitions do not end at NATO's easternmost borders. For two decades, Russian intelligence had worked to penetrate Western governments and societies. They funneled large sums of money to far-right movements, breeding xenophobic and nationalist political movements even inside of America, all with the goal of splintering the NATO alliance. These operations have been quite successful. Hungary today is more pro-Russia than pro-NATO, despite being a member of the alliance, and UK's Brexit movement was fueled in large part by Russian disinformation and propaganda. Democracies can be mercutial in nature, and while they have many strengths over a dictatorship like Russia, this is also their greatest weakness. With elections rapidly approaching for many Western nations, a swing in government could lead to a catastrophic reduction or even outright stop to support for Ukraine when it needs it most. However, there is one nation where such a shift would spell immediate doom for Ukraine, and that nation is more vulnerable to Russian propaganda than it ever has been. The United States has had a storied 10 years. During the Obama, Trump, and Biden presidencies, the US has gone from a strong NATO ally to uncertain partner in the alliance, leading to serious questions on European security, and now back once more to a strong ally and leader of the alliance. These whiplash-inducing shifts in national policy have severely shaken global confidence in US leadership and reliability, and in two years the US will face another presidential election. A massive shift away from its current policy could lead to an end in support for both Ukraine and NATO, and as the US has been responsible for the overwhelming bulk of financial, humanitarian, and military support to Ukraine, this would immediately doom the nation to defeat. But we might not have to wait two more years, because US midterm elections are rapidly approaching, and a massive shift in the legislative branch could also lead to an end of support for Ukraine. So what if Russia wins in Ukraine? Why does it matter to the rest of the world, and what would Russia do next? First, a Russian win in Ukraine would cement Putin's increasingly shaky hold on leadership. While he wouldn't be the heroic historical figure he dreams of being, Russia's price in blood and equipment has simply been too great for that to happen anymore, it would at least ensure that he remains in power for the long run. 
relations between NATO and Russia would continue to deteriorate even further with the threat of armed conflict escalating. The most immediate benefit to Russia would be control over the Black Sea, a strategically important body of water that also happens to be full of natural resources to exploit, including gas and oil. From Russian bases in Ukraine, the country could project much of its Cold War power in the region. The annexation of Ukraine, a foregone conclusion at this point should Russia win, would also mean that it has once more re-established the buffer between itself and the bulk of NATO forces, reversing one of the greatest catastrophes for Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But Ukraine is even more valuable for its resources. With Ukraine under its thumb, Russia would once more have control over a significant amount of world food staples such as wheat. As we have already seen in this war, Russia is not afraid of weaponizing food exports in order to drive public opinion against its enemies. In Africa, which is most affected by the blockade of Ukrainian wheat, Russian disinformation has not had to work very hard to turn public opinion against the West and its sanctions of Russia. By blaming the lack of food imports on Western sanctions instead of its own blockades, much of the developing world has called for an end to sanctions on Russia. Ukraine doesn't just export food to the developing world though, much of the rest of the world is also highly reliant on it, not just for wheat but things like sunflower oil. These commodities would now become weapons in the hands of Russia, who could threaten embargoes on nations not towing the Kremlin line. Ukraine's energy resources are also significant, especially in the East and the Black Sea. It's a little surprise that Russia has worked hard to liberate the Ukrainian East, as this is where a high concentration of energy resources exist. Allowing Russia to have control over these resources means further consolidating its position as a global energy superpower, and we've already seen how Russia wields energy as a political tool to attempt to sway the West. The Nord Stream pipeline explosions have crippled energy imports into Europe, and analysis of the destroyed pipes shows clearly that they were destroyed by line charges used in underwater demolition. Even before the pipelines were destroyed though, Russia was already either threatening to or actively cutting off gas exports to Europe. Now nations like Germany, who had a deep dependency on Russia for energy, are facing an extremely cold winter. With Ukraine under its thumb, Russian influence would grow massively as it brings even more energy resources under its control. Moldova, however, has serious problems if Russia wins in Ukraine. Its breakaway region of Transnistria already hosts several hundred Russian troops who are there allegedly as peacekeepers. This area is very pro-Russian and would make for an easy excuse for Russian forces to next invade Moldova in its entirety, restoring it to the old Soviet fold. Unlike Ukraine, Moldova simply doesn't have the military infrastructure or even size for NATO to supply it in case of war, and even with Russia's extraordinarily poorly performing military, the nation would quickly fall. Emboldened by success in Ukraine and Moldova, it's very possible Putin would next turn his attention to the Baltic states, territories that he has long wanted to return back into the Soviet fold. Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia all border Russia and are very difficult for NATO to defend from a Russian invasion. By driving his forces deep into the Baltic in a fait accompli attack, Russia could splinter NATO as he's always dreamed of doing. The alliance would be forced to decide if it's worth risking a third world war just to defend its most minor members. With confidence in NATO's Article 5 shaken, members geographically closer to Russia might see it's in their best interest to align itself with a resurgent Moscow, rather than threatening angering it further. With no real legitimacy left, the binding power of Article 5 would disintegrate and with it possibly the alliance. Now go check out US World War III plan or click this other video instead.